All right, everybody, how you doing? Uh, I'm going to give you guys time to come into the live live stream discussion today. Um, I have a very special guest, uh, my very good friend, my respected colleague, Mr. Warren Ballantyne, has come in to join uh, us today on Dr. Boyce TV. Uh, how you doing today, man? I'm doing good, man. I'm blessed. Today is my birthday, so excuse the sunglasses, everybody. I, I, I left my regular glasses because I was in Miami and New York, and I left my glasses in one of the hotels. So excuse the oh. sunglasses. These are prescription. So excuse the sunglasses. <laughs> wow, man. Well, happy birthday, brother. Ha ha happy happy 28th birthday. I, man, uh, look, I, I, I ain't seen 28 in 17 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, man, every year I'm, I'm going to wish you a happy 28th birthday. And uh, we, and that's all it's gonna be. Yeah, I ain't yes, gonna sir. change your age because then if I change your age, I gotta change mine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, hey man, so let me uh, let me let me throw this at you. Uh, you know, you, you are you are not just a respected uh, radio show host, nationally syndicated. Uh, you know, just a good black man, but also you are from Chicago, uh, and you, right. you 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 know the hood, you know the people, you love the people, the people love you. Um, did you by chance? Um, hear anything about this recent report that said 45% of all black men in Chicago uh, have no job and are and basically are not in school. Uh, did you hear anything about that? Yeah, yeah, I did, man. And, and honestly, you know, I, I would probably figure the number might be a little bit higher than that, to be honest with you, boys. Um, you know, Chicago, uh, born and raised, grew up on the south side, went to Limbloom for high school in Inglewood, and loved my city, loved my people. But the reality of it is, is that Chicago on the south side and the west side of Chicago, there's no economic growth. You know, I, I hear people always talking about the civil rights movement and equality. And what I talk about on the radio all the time, we don't need equality. We need equity. We don't, we don't need equality anymore because, see, equity is a different argument. I'm 6'1", 6'2", on a good day. If I'm trying to see over a 6'4 fence and the brother next to me is 5'11", if you give me two inches where I can see over the fence at six four, you give him two inches, we got the same thing. We equal, but he still can't see over the fence because now he's still six one. He's three inches short. He needs mm. equity. And that's the thing that we need in our community. We need to talk about equity and how do we create this. And and even though the economy, statistically speaking, is supposed to be booming, the reality of it is the people in the street, the people in the hood, because of the criminal justice system, because of what's happening in our community, we don't have economic growth and we don't have and we don't have that equity. I mean, you think about this. You have people who are literally opening up weed dispensers all, all over the country. You have politicians, right? John Boehner, the former Speaker of the House, is now working with weed companies to create people to buy weed and stocks and everything else. But you got brothers who have records based on marijuana sales who still can't get a job because this scarlet letter is following them forever. So when you have that scarlet letter following you forever, when you go apply for a job, you're not getting a job. So if you can't get a job, what are you going to do? You're going to turn back to the street because you ain't got nowhere else to go. But this is purposely done. It's, it's strategic. As I tell my listeners every day on the radio, we love to say that we live in a capitalistic country. I said, but if you think about capitalism, the definition itself is less than. Because you have a 1%, you have a middle working class, and then you have the, the poor. So you got two subjects that's less than the 1%. So if you automatically working on a premise of somebody's going to be less than, you have to create an atmosphere to create less than. And this is what's going on in Chicago. And it's not just going on in Chicago. It's going on in Atlanta. It's going on in LA. It's going on in St. Louis. It's going on all across the country where there's urban areas and there's a huge population of black and brown people. Uh, everybody, I'm speaking with uh, Mr. Warren Ballantyne. Um, and Warren is a respected radio show host and activist, uh, brilliant black man, attorney, all these other great things. And and uh, and we're talking about the city of Chicago. Uh, there's a recent report that said that 45 percent, a whopping 45 percent of all black men in Chicago uh, have no job and have no education. They're not in school and they don't have a job. And um, and, and I think <clears throat> the question becomes, uh, you know, how we get to the bottom of this. Now, everybody who just came in, please make sure you hit the thumbs up button. Please share this video. And I want to also remind you that you are in the space uh, at Dr. Boyce TV uh, for intelligent black people. So if you're not if you're not black and intelligent, you may want to get the fuck out because we're about to. <laughs> this is why I love you, brother. 
This is why I love you right here. This is why I love you. I tell people on the radio, if boys watching can't do nothing that's going to ever stop me from loving him. I might disagree with an argument, but this is my man for life. I'm with you. <laughs> look, look, look. I'm with you until to the wheels fall off, the engine fall off, the doors fall off, and we ain't got nothing else. And then even we ain't got nothing else. If you can run and I can run, I'm still with you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, you know, I, I, I respect that. And I think that that's what people – that's what people don't understand, like what what loyalty means, you know, like right. I learned a lot about loyalty from like watching my father and how he was loyal to my mother for 40, 45 years in marriage, even when there's many situations, I'm sure, where they they could have easily got divorced. They, I'm sure Absolutely. they, you know, each of them have hurt each other. Things have happened, you know, things like that. And uh, my mother was loyal to my father. And, and, and what I learned from that was loyalty is not some old fair weather shit. Loyalty is not like, oh, I'm down with you until it gets hard, you know, or, <clears throat> you know, loyalty is not, OK, I got your back until I disagree with you, in, in which case I'll start calling you a motherfucker. You know what I mean? Like, that's not loyalty. Loyalty is not, you know, like I'm going to stick with it until I just don't want to stick with it no more. Loyalty is an honor. Lo loyalty means honor. Honor means if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it, even if that means I got to do it until it's done and dead. And, and the reason that loyalty is not uh, common in society is because for many people, loyalty is uh, compared to stupidity. They consider that right. stupid. Like, uh, I don't know if anybody else watches Game of Thrones. You watch Game of Thrones by chance? Oh, man, I'm a huge Game of Thrones fan. Love it. So you saw last night where that white watch blew up, like burned down the whole damn city and shit, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. But now, now, now here's the thing. Right. What's loyalty? Loyalty is Jon Snow. Jon Snow. Every time Jon Snow was tempted to, to, you know, to do something different, he said, no, that's my queen. Right. And, you know, and they say, well, John, why don't you why don't you tell a lie? Just just this once. He's like, no, that's my queen. I made an oath. You know, and every time it comes up, he's like, no, that's my queen. I ride with her. Now, pay, now think about this, though. Now, because he was loyal to her all the way to, to this point. All these people have died. The whole city done got burned down. So a lot of people will look at that and say, man, that's so stupid. Like, why would you have been loyal to her? You knew she was going to do something crazy. You should have shut it down early. All those people wouldn't have died. But people don't understand. Loyalty sometimes means looking, looking a little stupid. You know, where people are like, man, why are you riding with so-and-so? Like, you got that got you locked up or that got you killed. Well, loyalty means if I make a commitment, I stick to the fucking commitment. Period. Well, 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 I'll take it even a little step further, right? If I'm Jon Snow, after Khaleesi burns up the city, I'm even more loyal. You know why? She burned up the city because her girl head was beheaded by Cersei. She burned up the city because they killed two of her babies, the dragons. So she's being loyal to the people who are not even here anymore to say, I'm going to avenge you in the name of loyalty, which means if I'm Jon Snow, that's my chick for life at this point because I know even if they take me out, she gonna ride for me when I'm dead and gone. So I got a whole different, <laughs> I got a whole different perspective on that. Man, well, I tell you, some, some situations really test your loyalty. So you gotta be smart about who you get loyal to. Or like my homeboy used to say, uh, he's a pastor, his name's Kevin Cosby out of Kentucky. He used to say, I always told my wife that if she ever leaves me, I'm going with her. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So everybody, I'm speaking, I'm speaking to Mr. Warren Ballantyne. He's a nationally syndicated radio show host, a brilliant attorney, a good black man. And we're talking about, uh, more importantly, the city of Chicago. Hit the thumbs up button, please. Please hit the thumbs up button. Uh, and we're talking about uh, this recent uh, story that just came out in the Chicago Tribune or Chicago Sun-Times, excuse me, that says 45 percent of Chicago's young black men are out of school and jobless. And they. Uh, so I'm going to read a little bit of this to you, Warren. I'd like to get your take on it. Um, they first start talking, they first give a story of a young brother who's, uh, who's out looking for jobs and, and it's, it's tough one. So they always start off with the personal story, but here's, here's the big picture. They said about 45% of black men in Chicago, age 20 to 24, were neither working nor in school in 2017, the analysis found nearly 20% of Latino men in that group were, were, were out of work and not in school. So it's about half for Latinos and it is for blacks, um, taking into account women, 37% of Chicago's young black adults don't have a job and are not attending school. Uh, in, in Chicago, only 5.7% of white young adults between 20 and 24 are, are out of school and out of work. So, so Warren, what this is basically saying is that, uh, that if you're black in Chicago, 
you are nine times more likely, if you're young and black in Chicago, you're nine times more likely to be jobless and, uh, and, 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 uh, and effectively uneducated. Um, based on what you know about Chicago, you know, and your experience growing up there, uh, first of all, did, did, did any of that surprise you when I gave you that data? It, it doesn't surprise me, but let me tell you why it doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me because we don't do two things in the black community that's essential, right? The two things that we need to do in the black community that's essential is one, we must teach entrepreneurship. See, entrepreneurship is something that it, if you work a nine to five job, when you die, you can't pass that job on to your child. But if you own something, if you own your own business, if you created your own lane, you can pass that down. So we don't teach entrepreneurship the way we used to teach it in the black community. When I was growing up, when I was coming up, you know, my grandfather uh, died six months after I was born. But at his death, he owned a lounge. He owned uh, three apartment buildings. He had his own home. He owned uh, a laundromat. He owned all these different businesses. So I grew up in the vein of entrepreneurship that you create your own, you own your own, you have your own. Now, my grandparents weren't educated. In fact, they had fifth grade education. Both of them dropped out of school in fifth grade. My parents weren't educated. They graduated from high school and that was it, never went to college. But all of them was entrepreneurs. They all had this entrepreneur uh, spirit. So because we don't have the entrepreneurship that we once had in the black community, we don't have the jobs. Because when we had the entrepreneurship, well, if a brother came in, who may have had a criminal record, who may have been a knucklehead as a young person, but now they got a baby and they coming in to my grandfather's uh, establishment saying, hey, I need a job because I'm trying to buy back for my kid. My grandfather would hire him on the spot. He didn't care what the record was. And see, that's the difference. You know, I tell people this all the time on, on, on the radio. People complain about white privilege. Forget white privilege. Create black privilege. Hire people who look like you. And the people who are getting hired you got to do not 100%, but 200%. You know why? Because the person that's hiring you is giving you an opportunity. If you do well, it opens the doors for everybody else that's coming after you. You have a responsibility, not just for yourself and your family, but for all of us. You are me. I am you. As Dr. King said, I can never be what I'm supposed to be unless you are what you're supposed to be. And if you at your best, it makes me be at my best. So when I look at my home city of Chicago, where I grew up, where I love coming from Inglewood, going to Limbloom, and the struggles that I've seen in Chicago, I, I tell people this all the time, nothing's different about Chicago, nothing. By the time I was 11 years old, I had seen two people's brains get blown out in front of me at 11 years old on the corner of my block. By the time I was 15 years old, I had went to maybe 55, 65 funerals in my lifetime at 15 from people getting killed, people I grew up with, went to high school with. In fact, when I was growing up, if you if you made it to your 21st birthday, it was a huge thing. And even today in Chicago, you think about the element, we have huge elementary graduation. Now, if you go anywhere else in the country, they don't even give graduations for eighth grade. But in Chicago, it's a huge thing because usually the kids aren't going to graduate from high school. Now, the reason why it's like that is because we don't have what I talked about in the first uh, segment of this. We don't have this 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 equity and this economic development. If we had this equity, if we had this economic development, and if we taught entrepreneurship, it would change everything. When I was growing up, it was a school called Washburn in Chicago, and it was a technical school where you can go and learn how to be a plumber, uh, electrician, a truck driver, all these other things, right? We don't have anything like that. They, now they have it in some schools like Simeon and CVS, and, and they have trades in those schools, but in those high schools, but we need something that's strictly for us. You know, one of the things uh, I want to touch on Nipsey Hussle for a minute because Nipsey was a friend of mine. I did work with Nipsey. Nipsey was always talking about how can we create, how can we create an avenue to change Black America when nobody's seeing it? And I always used to say, look, college isn't for everybody. It's not. And there's nothing wrong with learning how to do HVAC or being a cosmetologist or or, or being a plumber or electrician or truck driver, they make good money and they have good lives. And, and they don't have the college debt that somebody like you and I have who then went and got master's degrees, doctoral degrees and all this other stuff, you know? And so they don't have that debt that you and I have walking out. In fact, I, you know, I tell my sisters, I have four sisters, go be with somebody who don't have the debt that I have walking out. <laughs> you don't have walking out the door. You want somebody who literally, you know what? 
they went and got a CDL license. They owe ten thousand dollars, and they can make that and pay that off in a year. And now y'all can go and, and invest and have build your life together. So we have to look at this from a different angle and talk about it from a different angle. But more importantly, I think we have to have the conversation about who do we believe and support in this in this nation? Because when you think about all the money that's in the black community. We have more educated people. We have more millionaires. We have more billionaires than we've ever had before. The black community should not look the way it looked when we get all these people. Frederick Douglass said, we just needed the talent to 10, right? We needed the 10% and they could carry everybody else. Hell, we got 40% that's got degrees and look at what we're still dealing with. We shouldn't be dealing with this today. And I don't blame white America. I don't blame the government. Who I blame is us because at some point, if we don't realize none of these people care about us, none of these people are going to do shit for us. And if we don't realize we got to do for ourselves, I can't get mad at somebody who's white or somebody who's in the government or somebody who's a, a white supremacist who's saying you Negroes ain't doing nothing. I can't get mad at that because they're right. We have to turn this around. We have to look at each other and say, what are we going to do? What are we going to invest in one another to build each other up? so that we can create leverage. Now, boys, the greatest thing that law school taught me, it's, it, law school taught me two things, time management, and it taught me leverage. The greatest thing you can have in any relationship in your life is leverage. Whether you're talking about a, a male and female, whoever loves the hardest is in the weakest position because mm -hmm. the person who doesn't love the hardest has the leverage because the person who loves the, the hardest don't want the person to leave. And it's the same <laughs> thing when you're talking about creating wealth in the black community. If we keep our money in our community, if we start talking about trade schools and entrepreneurship and we start doing this, we create leverage points. Once we create those leverage points, then white America will acquiesce to us. We wouldn't have to acquiesce to anybody. I mean, even from a, a voting block, from an economic position, from, uh, look, I lived in Chicago my whole life, right? I grew up in Inglewood. When I made some money, I moved downtown Chicago. It was like two different Chicago. It, you know, I walk out my door, it's police everywhere and everybody know my name. Hey, Warren, how you doing? How you doing? How you doing? I, you know, me and my boys come in drunk, the police making sure we get to the house safe. In my neighborhood where I grew up from, that, that would never happen. So, I mean, it's, it's literally two worlds in Chicago and it shouldn't be two worlds if we create the leverage points, if we create the opportunities and the leverage point, and that's anywhere in America, Atlanta, LA, St. Louis, wherever you want to talk about it, it's the same thing. All right, everybody, I'm speaking to Mr. Warren Ballantyne. Warren is a nationally syndicated radio show host. He's also uh, a proud Chicago native and a good brother. And we're talking about a uh, recent report in Chicago Sun-Times that says that 45%, 45% of all black males between 20 and 24 <clears throat> in the city of Chicago have no job and are not in school or anything. And uh, this is a state of emergency. I've heard some of you say that. Uh, and what's 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 interesting about this, um, uh, Warren, is that you know th there's nothing there's nothing really surprising about this. You know, you you didn't seem surprised uh, uh, when you saw it. I wasn't surprised. Uh, they put they put stories like this out a couple times a year, and uh, we just kind of say, okay, you know, that's what it is. It's for black people. Now I want to show you a picture of a person, and I want to ask you. Uh, have you uh, are you familiar with this individual, uh, Lori Lightfoot? You, you familiar with her? Oh yeah, I'm familiar with Lori. Okay. So she's the new uh, mayor of Chicago. Um, she is. I'll expand the screen. You guys can see that she is melanated. Uh, she's black like us. Uh, but the question is, is she black like us or is she black like us? Meaning, is she, <laughs> is she really is she really one of us? Uh, and, and, I, uh, and I say that because uh, everybody wants us to get all excited about a black woman getting elected. Um, what's there to be excited about when you got massive sections of your community that have black and brown people in them that look just like you and you playing the same old damn game? You, you well, know, those communities pair because we know for a fact that if Chicago made it a priority to solve this problem, they will solve this problem. Well, right. she, told you, she told you who she was from the beginning, boys. I mean, this is the same thing I tell people about Donald Trump, right? I'm like, why are you mad at Trump? Trump told you who he was from the beginning. Don't be mad at Trump. Be, at the, be mad at the idiots who voted for Trump because he told you who he was. He told you. Lori did too. Look, after being elected, 
immediately weighed in on the Jesse Smollett conversation, right? Kim Fox is going to have to go if she don't do such and such and such and such. Now, look, Kim did what any other prosecutor across the country has the authority to do. They have the authority to decide to either prosecute or not prosecute, right? She did it, and, and, and now they rain in hell on her. But what about all, you know, to me, what Lori should have came in talking about was all the cops who lied in the case dealing with um, uh, uh, Laquan, who, who covered up stuff to, to try to help their partners, but they worried about this woman saying, well, I don't see it's enough evidence to prosecute. And to be honest with you, it, it, I know Kim, I love Kim, because th let me tell you a true story. When I first got out of law school, I came home and I was applying for a job. Kim was working at that job. I didn't know Kim Fox from, from nobody. She saw me out there sitting there as a black man. She came out there and said, look, you don't know me, but go ahead and tell them you know Kim Fox. Tell them we're friends. Tell them that I support you. She didn't know me from, from Adam. I got the job because of Kim, right? After that point, you know, I'm hey, I'm down with you for life because you showed me what kind of sister you really were. Because the average black person in those situations, I hate to be like this, they trying to push other blacks out or close the doors because they don't want nobody to outshine them or take their place at master's table. She wasn't like that. She was like, hey, I need more of us in here, which tells me what type of person she was from the beginning. When I hear Lori talking about, well, we got to look at what Kim doing and all this other stuff, she's telling who you, she's telling you exactly who you who she is, Chicago. She's telling you that even though she looks like you, she really ain't you. She ain't the streets. She ain't the people. She not. Because if she was the streets and she was the people, you would be the priority. She know what's going on in our community. She know what's happening in our hood. And if you gonna sit up here and say, well, I'm gonna attack Kim Fox because of Jesse Smollett, man, look, we got bigger problems in Chicago than attacking Kim Fox because she chose not to prosecute something. It, 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 to me, when we see people as Maya Angelou say, my Maya Angelou used to say, if somebody show you who they are from the beginning, believe them. Believe them. She's telling you who she is, just like Trump. What did Trump tell y'all? Melania, believe me, bigly believe me. I love the blacks. I know I don't really like the blacks. I don't like the Latinos. Bad hombre, bad hombre. He, he told you what he was going to do from the beginning. He told you. I mean, the dude told you this is the same thing that this chick is doing she's telling you when you look at how she's handling the kim fox and and, and, and this whole jesse smollett case that's telling you what you're gonna get chicago and and i'm gonna say this even on a national level right chicago is a witness everybody thought Rahm Emanuel was gonna be this great mayor for the city of chicago because he was barack obama's boy let me tell y'all something i was at the white house when Rahm Emanuel was there and didn't want to meet with nobody that was black so I tried to tell y'all and warn y'all that this dude didn't have us in his best interest. Let me tell you this. It is a bunch of people who think Biden is down for, for, for the cause and for black people. Look, I like Biden, but I'm gonna tell you like this. He, he's, he's a Rahm Emanuel in a different way. And I just leave it like that. Mm. Well, uh, everybody, uh, give me a yes or no, yes or no, yes or no. Do you think that Joe Biden will have the interests of black people at heart if he's president of the United States? Give a yes or no uh, question. Everybody answer this question. Uh, will Biden be good for black America? OK, I'm starting to see the no's coming in already. Um, now, uh, Warren, now I know you said you had to go pick your daughter up from school. And yep. so uh, I'm going to let you go ahead and, and do that, brother. And, um, and, uh, and I'm going to say that thank you for hanging out with us today. And uh, you're welcome to come back anytime you want. Uh, and I know I'm going to come on your show, man. And I, I look now, forward to Now, boys, you ain't coming on my show. I'm giving you a segment on my show. You ain't coming on. I'm giving you a segment, brother, because, look, this is the way I feel. I feel like it's a place at the table for all of us. We got to support each other. We may not always see eye to eye, but it ain't about seeing eye to eye. It's about if you are giving a good message, if you're giving a good message that's the truth, I don't care what you're talking about. I don't care if you talking about religion, relationships, whatever. If it's the truth and it's who you are, I'm going to support the hell out of that. Because if I can't support you and let you be the greatness that you are, I can never be great. I can't be great. I can't help my people if I don't help you. What kind of mm -hmm. person would I be if, 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 if I'm saying, well, I'm all about us as a people, 
But then at the same time, I'm not trying to pull you up as a person. It's, it's the craziest mm -hmm. thing. I tell my people on the show, I have a motto, push me and I'll pull you. That way, if you pushing me up the mountain and I'm pulling you up, when I get to the top of the mountain, I'm not looking down on you and you're not looking up at me because we side by side. You didn't push me up, but I didn't pull you up the same time. That's the way we have to be. It shouldn't be, well, because I disagree with you or because you're not giving me this opportunity, I'm just going to hate on you. I'm going to talk bad about you. I'm going to do all these other things uh, about you. The reality of it is that it is, it is a lane for everybody. And because it's a lane for everybody, we don't have to be in competition. It's no competition. This is about us as a people. So mm -hmm. I have enough sense, boys, that guess what? I have G sense, right? And, and when I tell people I have G sense, they always like, what the hell are you talking about? And I always say, you ever seen a flock of geese flying? It's one goose out in front. That one goose takes as much as it can take. When it can't take no more, it falls back and another goose goes to the front, right? Then you see them flying in a flock like this, right? And you have the one, the one particular goose in the back that looks like it's drunk. It's flying back and forth, right? So what happens is it's watching all the other geese. If somebody gets tired, that goose comes underneath that particular goose that's tired to keep the formation tight, right? And then they fly in this beautiful flock. And I say, imagine if Black people had geese sense. Imagine if we could understand that we can take turns in leadership position. We ain't always got to be the leader. We can sometimes be the one in, in the rotation. Imagine if every time one of us failed, somebody was right there to catch us. And then imagine if we learn how to fly like a flock in this sense. A geese can only travel 12 miles an hour by an individual goose. But when they fly in a the flock, they can travel up to 70 miles an hour. So they get much more by traveling as a flock than an individual goose. Now, just imagine if we had geese sense in the black community, what the fuck we really could be doing in the black community. Right on. All right. I love that. Uh, I hope you guys love that, too. Uh, now, uh, Warren, uh, people are asking where they would actually be able to hear your show. Where, where can people, uh, is there a way, we could, like a website or anywhere people can go to find out where you listed in the different What's cities? That, uh, well, well, I guess people want to know where they can hear your show. Okay. They can follow me uh, on uh, Instagram, Truth Fighter. They can follow me on, um, what's that, Twitter, at Truth Fighter One. And then Facebook, just Warren Ballantyne. But if you go on there, I, I post every day. My show is on from 10 to noon every day, Eastern Time. I post where you can listen to that. I also have a YouTube page, uh, uh, Warren Ballantyne or Truth Fighter on the YouTube page. But I post on there because it's all across the country. And then it's on iTunes and, and um, uh, what's that, uh, what is the iHeart and all that other stuff through the radio stations. But if you follow me on any of the social media, yeah, I'll post it up there and you get all the information. I post it every day. Monday. All right. All right. Perfect. Uh, so um, everybody, please give Warren a digital round of applause for giving us his time. Uh, it looked like you froze up, Warren, but I'm going to go ahead and let you go, brother, so you can get with your daughter. Uh, it uh, looks like you froze a little bit, but uh, th thank you so much, brother. I appreciate you hanging out with us today, man. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you, brother. Have a good day. Give my best to your family. And uh, you, we'll, we'll definitely do this again. Uh, okay, so everybody, um, one of the things I wanted to uh, mention to you guys too is that a little bit later, I'm going to actually come back and I want to do a quick little uh, monologue conversation about this uh, 45%, uh, you know, issue, right? It's, it's, it's solvable, um, it's fixable, and uh, there are people that know how to fix this. You know, um, I, I live in Chicago and I know that you know, these, these communities can be easily repaired. Um, they're not repaired by the politicians because they don't care. Uh, also, the other interesting thing about it is that there are people in the community that know how to solve these problems. Louis Farrakhan in the Nation of Islam could easily solve this problem. So if you really were this mayor, uh, Lori Lightfoot, and you really cared about this problem, what would you do? You know, you go to the people that can solve it and you give them the resources they need it. So if they went to the Nation of Islam and said, look, we don't know what to do. You know, we don't we, we don't connect with the people on the south side and the west side, but we're going to give you guys one hundred million dollars to go create jobs for these young men and give them skills that will help them survive and help them to also gain knowledge and education. They could do that in a second. Right. Uh, Freedom Home Academy International run by Marcus Klein is right there in the south side of Chicago. 
They're educating children. They're educating five-year-olds up to high school children at a level. I went to the school. I visited this school because we made a donation to the big. I gave I gave about five grand. I don't say big it was big for me. Five thousand dollars. You know, I don't give. I don't throw my money around like that. But I gave them five thousand dollars. My cousin gave them seven thousand dollars because he came with me. And he was so impressed with the school. Uh, Marcus Klein, Freedom Home Academy International, is educating black children at a level that far exceeds any of these white universities out here where y'all going deep in debt, going to learn from these white folks. So if you wanted these young people to be educated, it's very easy. All you have to do is go to Marcus and say, Marcus, we don't understand black people. We don't know exactly what to do, but we can give you the resources so you can do what you do. Here's 50 million, Marcus. Go duplicate your model. Go duplicate your model. Pay attention. Please listen to me. I'm talking to you about this. This is important. Duplicate your model so that you can educate 100,000 kids at the same level you're educating these two or 300 that you're educating right now, right? It, it, it tell yes or no, does it sound simple? Does that solution sound simple to you? Well, it sounds simple because it's a simple problem. You know, I'm a mathematician. We solve problems for a living. This is not a problem that requires you to know how to do calculus. This is only a problem that is confusing because we don't understand the calculus of white supremacy. You know, the mathematics, white, white people's mathematics is, is, is a very different kind of math from the math that runs the universe. You know, regular mathematics says, oh, it's easy. Just find the models that are working and duplicate those models. But white folks' mathematics is where you do things that don't make any sense, where you believe that two plus two is 187. You see, here's white folks' mathematics. The reason why Lori Lightfoot, this lady who's supposed to be your ally, who allegedly looks like you, uh, who doesn't have anything to do, but still, honestly, doesn't have a whole lot in common with those people who are struggling, does not care. Um, Lori Lightfoot will never go and do the natural thing, which would be to just give a few million dollars to the Nation of Islam so they can replicate uh, business models and teach entrepreneurship. Uh, instead, uh, and why, why won't she do that? Well, because she's scared to go be seen with Farrakhan. Why? Well, because her slave masters told her that Farrakhan was uh, that he was a hateful person, even though he doesn't promote hate at all. They, you know, her masters told her, well, we've, we define him as being violent and anti-Semitic, even though there's no evidence that he behaves this way. Right. Uh, and, but he's one of the few people that knows how to solve this problem. So your city has a problem. The solutions are out there. You're not pursuing the solutions, which tells me that you don't want to see the solutions. You see, because you're able to solve the problem on how to make white Chicago safe and prosperous and good. You fix that problem. You solve that problem every year on autopilot. But you cannot solve the problem of what it takes to make sure that young black men and young black women in the south and the west side of Chicago are able to provide for their families, are able to have a have a future. Right. And so uh, so really. And I want to think on this a little bit more um, and I'm going to lay out some thoughts. But uh, there's you know another another thought that uh, actually sort of applied to what I was thinking is, uh, you know, I remember once uh, I read another statistic like that about what black men were going through. And uh, and I, I spoke to someone who was connected to a, a major corporate brand and this corporate brand, you know, they, they use black males as their um, template, as their model for, you know, fashion trends or setting uh, trends. Black men are sin trendsetters. So the 16, 17 year old black male is a fashion trendsetter for other people around the world. Everybody wants to imitate us. Everybody wants to be black, but nobody wants to be black. Well, you know, one of the things I, I did was I reached out and I said, well, you know, if you guys want to do, I said, the solution for these young brothers is easy. Just teach them all how to be entrepreneurs, teach them all how to start their own businesses, you know, and then they get skills, whether they become plumbers or lawyers or, or whatever they become uh, or sell T-shirts, you know, like Nipsey Hussle's uh, shop, the marathon does they'll be better off as entrepreneurs because they can create their own jobs. And, and then that community becomes a hub of job creation. All you need is some training and some capital. If you give them training and capital, then you can have thousands of jobs created just like that. And uh, what the person said was, they said, well, we, we, we had thought about doing something with you, but we feel that your brand is, uh, or, they, or the people I talked to felt that your brand was a little too risky. And I said, that's your goddamn problem. That's why these problems don't get solved, because you see the black man as inherently risky. You see the only Negroes that you want to work with are the safe Negroes who, who are completely out of touch and disconnected from what these brothers are going through. You don't want to go to the real men that they really need to listen to and hear from that they're actually going to respond to. You want to go to some old punk ass uh, wannabe white guy 
that, you know, where you've given him a bunch of money and you wonder why he spent $20 million on your, on your stupid initiative and the shit didn't work. You want to come in there, give them internships and, and little part-time jobs and all this other nonsense when these people need something that's going to be fundamentally transformative in terms of where their opportunity set is. So if I want to go, if I really want to change a community, I, I go in and I give resources to the pe people that know that community. It ain't even got to be me. I don't really care, you know, what I'm doing, you know, whatever voice is doing in this process. Like, I'll help out if you want me. If not, that's fine. But you can't look at, you know, the Boyce Watkinses of the world or the Louis Farrakhan's of the world and say, oh, well, they're scary. We don't want to go near them. But then sit back and wonder why you have millions of black men that are marginalized and being economically destroyed. So my model, my plan in terms of how I'm, I'm combating this issue is I'm not going to the gatekeepers because I don't trust those people. You know, I'm not going to the politicians because politicians stink to me. If you in the city of Chicago and you're running that damn city and half of your damn city is dying, I have no respect for you because you have no desire to fix the problem. You either don't care or you don't have the power to do it. Either way, you wasted my damn time. You wasted my time. I'm not going to a thousand meetings with you to sit there and talk to you ad nauseum about problems that can be solved with the, with the snap of a finger. I, I don't want to do that. I'll let you waste your life pretending like you're making a difference when you really know that you're not making a difference at all because the city's going to be exactly the same when you leave as it was when you arrived. So you ain't done shit. Right. I don't I don't want to deal with the corporations that take that take two years before they decide to write one tiny check. And then when they write the check, you got to do everything exactly the way they want it done. And and if they feel that you're in the least bit risky or nervous or, or like they they watch one of my podcasts, I talk about white supremacy and then I cuss at the same time. Well, shit, that makes me a dangerous Negro. Forget the fact that I have more education than ninety nine point nine percent of the white people I've ever met. Forget the fact that I'm an absolute one of the world's leading experts on what it takes to solve the black economic problem. Forget the fact that I've done 15,000 YouTube videos and sharing my analysis with the rest of the world. Forget the fact that I build a, a, a multi-million dollar platform by myself with no help from white people, which takes a lot of energy and creativity. Uh, forget the fact that I'm able to influence millions of people. Forget all of that. No, he's just dangerous and we feel uncomfortable and we just don't want to be, uh, we don't want to be near that because we're just not sure what we're going to get. Why do you feel that way? You feel that way because you define the black man to be dangerous. The black man scares you. And as long as the black man scares you, you will never be able to help solve the problems of the black man in America. I scare you. And I ain't never carried no gun. I ain't never threatened to hurt nobody. I ain't never went out here and thugged out and, and uh, shot up a school. I ain't, never, I ain't never done that. I don't have a criminal record. But yet I scare you. Why do I scare you? Maybe it's because I represent part of the spirit of Marcus Garvey which was a threat to national security, maybe because I carry the spirit of a Malcolm X, something that your, your entire system's been designed to reject uh, since, since you know, its inception, right? Maybe that's what scares you. But either way, um, you know, I, I see these problems and the problems frustrate me, not because they're hard to solve. They frustrate me because they're very easy to solve. But yet we take the simple stuff, the simple realities, and we make them complicated. So if I go to some politician, I say, well, why is it that so many uh, uh, black men are just being killed and ain't got jobs and ain't in school and getting poorly educated? They'll give me a long list. We wrote a report. The report is uh, 3000 pages. And we did this analysis on why the Negro can't be educated because it's just impossible. We've tried. We put $10 billion into it. And we just don't know what to do. So what you're basically saying, the translation is that you're telling me that black people are animals. You're telling me that we are so fucked up that no matter how much money you put into us, we can't be elevated the way white people can. No matter how hard you try to educate us, we simply can't be educated because our brains are made out of peanut butter, right? You, you know, no matter how hard you try, you just can't elevate those people. Well, then you're, you're basically talking like a racist because that's what a racist does. A racist will say, there's just something wrong with those people. And I don't know why they end up poor. I don't know why they end up dead. I don't know why they end up jobless. Well, you know, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating to see how dumb white supremacists get when it comes to talking about white supremacy and racism. Like they, they just don't get it. And, uh, and as a smart person, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to say I'm, I'm probably kind of smart because I, I went to school a long time. But as a, as a, as a person who thinks very deeply about things, I find myself getting really frustrated 
when the answer is right there in front of us and we don't pursue it. So I'm not even going to do another video on this later because I, I did it, it, it would just it would just make me angry. And I'm trying to be cool, keep my blood pressure down. But let me uh, let me tell you this. I'm not going to the gatekeepers. I'm not going to the schools. I'm not going to the fucking politicians. I'm not going to the corporations because I don't trust any of them. I don't believe in any of them. I don't believe they want black men like me uh, talking to young black people because uh, because if they even ignite two percent of what I if they apply even two percent of what I teach them, th you won't be able to control them anymore. Um, and just like my teachers couldn't control me when I when I really decided I wanted to do something, I became a nightmare for that white woman who was running my classroom. Um, so instead of going to all of them, I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you directly. The internet gives me the opportunity to speak to you directly because when it comes to these young men, you are their mothers. You know, you are their fathers. You are their siblings. You maybe some of them are you. You know, you are uh, their, their friends and you're the ones that I seek to convince when I share solutions with you. I don't waste my time sharing these solutions with corporations or with uh, universities or with politicians because they don't want to apply it. They don't want to solve the problem. They don't want to hear the solution. Even Obama, you you know, you guys loved him because he was black and all that shit, whatever. But the reality was that Obama never met with a credible black economic authority when it came to solving black economic problems. Every time they met to talk about black unemployment, he would bring in Al Sharpton. What the fuck does Al Sharpton know about how to create a job? Now, if you need to know how to preach the Bible, then then Al Sharpton might be your guy. He's a pastor. If you want to learn how to how to find some good chemicals to put in your conch and your perm, then Al is your man. If you want to learn how to implement a Weight Watchers diet, you know, because Al, give him credit, the man lost a lot of weight, then Al could be your guy. You know, you have a weight loss. Michelle Obama had the fitness program. Maybe Al would have been good for that. You know, Al lost a lot. I, was, I respect that. But when you're trying to solve um, serious economic problems that are going to affect millions of people, and you keep bringing in the same preacher with a perm over and over again, that means you ain't serious. That means you playing games up in that motherfucker. That means that you think the black community is retarded. And maybe that's true. Maybe 80% of us are blind, deaf, and dumb. So that's another reason why I don't waste my time talking to people who want to be blind, deaf, and dumb. I, I'm talking to the 20% who's got some common motherfucking sense. I'm talking to the people who are looking for solutions and the people who are looking for the truth. So when it comes to these 45% of these young people not having jobs, you know, young people can't, you know, ain't in school, sitting out in the streets, getting shot down. Do you understand that I can explain to you? I read this morning, I read an entire report from the DEA that explained in extreme detail exactly how the guns and drugs get into Chicago and why the gang violence erupted because they started locking up all the gang leaders on RICO charges in the 80s and 90s, thanks to people like Bill Clinton and Joe Biden, who uh, sent them away. And then what happens was at that point, the gang splintered. And so you no longer needed permission from the gang leader to go and kill somebody. So if you got pissed at somebody over some personal shit, you could just go off that motherfucker and had to ask nobody shit. And then when somebody gets killed, then next thing you know, of course, there's going to be a retaliation. My God, how are you going to let somebody kill your homie or kill your cousin, kill your sibling, and you don't retaliate? Well, then at that point, you have chaos. Well, what does that come from? Well, it comes from the fact that every living soul pretty much on the planet, especially the mammals, that male role models are really important. That even if, whether you're talking about elephants or, or buffalo or bears, the male role models are extremely important. Young adolescent bears need older male bears to help tell them what to do. Those are the OGs. That You need the OGs so that the OGs can calm the young guy down and say, whoa, don't go kill him today. Don't do that. That's what Jim Brown was doing out there in L.A. He was getting the guys to slow it down. That's what Farrakhan does. Farrakhan's the ultimate OG. He's the triple OG because when Farrakhan speaks, all the black men listen. 
Black men who don't listen to nobody listen to Louis Farrakhan. Farrakhan could get any rapper on the phone, no matter how crazy he is and how ratchet he might be, and he will bow with respect to Farrakhan because the, the men look at other men in a specific way. And so when you take those men out of the community and you go out of your way to marginalize them, the reason you do that, of course, is because you want to maintain control over that community and to destroy the community. And you know that the, the way to destroy the community is to destroy the men that are leading the community. You kill out the alphas and then you can just kind of you can kind of feast on the pack right you know so so you get rid of all the fathers in the communities and that, that's when you can send in the r kelly's who can go rape your daughters and 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 use up the women and and steal from you and kill you and the cops can come in and and shoot anybody they want and beat anybody they want slam big mama's head onto the concrete and all of that stuff well because you lost your male role models why well because you go back to bill clinton's era when he started doing shit like the three strikes law and they started pushing those rico laws where guys were being sent to prison for 30 or 40 years, well, then all the fathers were being sent to prison. A big chunk of them, not all of them, but many fathers were being sent to prison. Many of the gang leaders who maintained order in the gangs, who held who held codes of conduct in the gangs. I and mean, sure, you can say what you want about gang banging. You can criticize it, you can love it, you hate it. I don't really care. But one thing you can say is that when a gang is when gang, when 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 when, when gang culture is executed properly, there is a, a very specific, very clear code of conduct. And in fact, that's consistent throughout the world. Gangs exist everywhere. The European Economic Union is a gang. The Asian Pacific Union is a gang. NAFTA was an economic gang. Corporations are nothing but a gang. They're just a gang of people that came together with the same goal, with a code of conduct. They put their money together, and next thing you know, you have Apple Computer, right? So gang affiliation is something that is consistent all throughout the animal kingdom and throughout the world. So when you take those gangs, though, and you're killing off the leadership, then when there's a vacuum of leadership, chaos emerges. So the same thing that happens in South Shy Chicago is similar to what happened in Iraq. When Bush went into Iraq and took out the leadership, what happened? What happened? Chaos ensued. People were getting killed. There were warlords forming little tribes and bands and groups and gangs and attacking each other. Lots of chaos. Why? Well, because there was no central order. There was no code of conduct. There was no authority that could, that could maintain order in that space. Right? So in Chicago, that's a big part of the reason why you have so much gang violence because the, the men are not there to maintain order. And when the men do come back home, the young people are like, well, we ain't listening to you. Whatever, we might kill you too. In terms of the joblessness and the education issue, young black men don't have jobs because white people don't give a fuck about you. And stop thinking that they do because I'm tired of it. I'm tired of hearing people telling me this kumbaya bullshit, like, oh, you know, integration is a good thing and we've come a long way. We ain't, we ain't travel worth a shit. We haven't gone two inches. What the fuck are you talking about? What statistic are you showing me? Can you show me a statistic that says that we are that much better off economically or otherwise than we were before integration happened? Tell, give me a statistic that proves me wrong. Seriously. You just happy because white people like you. You just happy because they gave you the self-esteem that you should have got somewhere else. You just you just happy because you've always been led to believe through media and otherwise that his ice is colder than yours and that being next to him makes you a better person and that that somehow that 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 one day we shall overcome and 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 then everybody's going to love everybody and everything's going to be good. Well that day ain't never coming, goddammit. So stop believing that shit. And when you see statistics like that that tell you that 45% of these young black men ain't got jobs and ain't in school and just sitting out in the street waiting to die, why is that not considered to be a state of emergency? If they cared about you, if that damn black lady who's running the city of Chicago gave a nickel's ass about you, she would consider that to be a state of emergency. She would say, we must make sure that this year, this is the top priority to make sure that we drop that black male unemployment rate. Yo, we cut it in half. She would say that and she would go in and she would fix the issue immediately because she's got the resources to do it. But instead, they will put more energy into building a new football stadium than they will put into going out and trying to save the lives of black men. So here's what you need. Here's the solution. The only solution for the black man in America is he must learn how to start businesses. He must. We must, as black men, go back to the drawing board. We must, as black men, get off the grid. 
Get off the fucking grid. Get off the grid. Stop following the pathways that are given to you by people who don't love you. People who don't love you, they tell you, oh, well, well, you know, Tyrone, you can be successful. Just go to college and get $100,000 in debt and get a college degree, and then you're going to be great. Do you know how many black people I know that got master's degrees, bachelor's degrees, law degrees, and even PhDs who cannot get a job? Do you know how many black people, educated Negroes I know who are so buried under student loan debt that they can't even breathe? That have just given up trying to pay the debt. Do you know? Tell me yes or no. Tell me if you know anybody. Do you know who's just like student loans payments are so high that they literally are just like, fuck it, I'm not paying this shit. Do you know that half of all black college graduates have been financially mutilated by student loans? When I say mutilated, I mean gone into default and can't re repay those loans at all and are going to die in debt. So their wealth, their family wealth is going to go backward. So what did you accomplish? Oh, but but you's an educated nigga. You's a edu you's a fine educated nigga. You I went to white man university and he gave me a piece of paper and I paid two hundred thousand dollars for the piece of paper, master. So that makes me that makes me successful. I is a successful nigga because I got my good nigga sticker right here. So let me pull it out of my wallet and show you my good nigga sticker. It's in it's in balance standing, son. That's got to mean something, son. But your dumb ass sitting there buried in debt can't get a job that you like and so stressed out from working with white folks every day that you want to damn near kill yourself in a liquor bottle every night just to just to cope, just to survive, just to stay sane. I'm not making fun of you. I'm not making fun of people. If that's who you are, I'm not making fun of you for this. It's a it's a it's a rope adult. You get sucked into that shit. You get sucked into that 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 mindset. And it, so I'm not making fun of you. I'm making fun of all of us. If I make fun of you, I'm making fun of me too. Because I've fallen for that nonsense too. So I'm telling you right now, if you want, and I'm going to say this to the day I die, white America as a collective has shown zero interest or, or ability to truly and properly integrate black people into their society. Black men must withdraw and apply all your resources toward learning how to build your own. Start with the basic stuff. Go learn how to start a business. Just go start. Start reading books about it. Start watching videos about it. Talk to people about it. Start learning, getting that hustle mentality. Learn how to build your own. Young black men, especially. You're 20, 22, 23 years old. You got a lot of energy. You, maybe you got some free time on your hands. Take the time you would have spent, you know, doing other things and just spend some of that time learning how to build something for your family. Uh, there ain't no, if you got a relative that's in prison right now or about to get out or is in and out or has a criminal record. Tell them, stop looking for jobs. Stop begging these white people to take care of you because they're going to give you the worst jobs with the worst pay. And then they might fire you on your day off when they get tired of using you up. Go learn how to start a business so you at least at least you have a shot. At least you have a shot at preserving your dignity. At least you have a shot at having some sort of prosperity in your life. You know, so if we want our black men to have a shot, we got to give them another path. You know, if we don't give them another path, we're going to end up the, every 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 year. They're going to have articles like this. And these articles, these same damn articles are going to be written 50 years from now. And uh, people are going to wonder, why haven't we advanced? So that's it, guys. I'm, I'm going to go. As you can see, I'm very I'm very angry about that article. But it's it's not like they told me anything new. They just told me what I already knew, you know. Um, so I'm out of here. Please hit the thumbs up button. Uh, thumbs up, everybody. Please hit the thumbs up button. And uh, also, you know, if you want to read good books, um, you know, you guys know I love Powernomics. So uh, feel free to go to drboycebooks.com. And somebody asked where you can actually get my new book. And my new book, Black American Money 3, is uh, coming out May 19th on Malcolm X's birthday. So you can go to drboycebooks.com. You can order all of my books there. Um, and as well as Dr. Claude Anderson's books, things like that. I ride with Dr. Claude Anderson. I have invested heavily in the support of what he's doing with uh, with the um, Harvest Institute, as well as the Powernomics Corporation, because uh, for black men, black men have to be we have to understand that like we are in warfare. And when you're in warfare, you have to unify, you have to fight. Uh, now, I see on YouTube, they, they shut down my feed <laughs> on one of the YouTube channels. So I don't know if that's deliberate or if it just happened by accident. But either way, I'm out of here, guys. Have a good day. Um, I'll see you guys soon. Uh, oh, yeah, I will be in Philly on the 19th as well. So that's uh, you can go to drboysphilly.com to learn more. Uh, drboysphiladelphia.com. drboysphiladelphia.com. Take care, guys. Have a good day.